Welcome fellow horror hounds and welcome to the latest episode of Talk and Stalk, your unholy home for horror. I'm your host as always, Barry, and today's podcast is going to be devoted to a horror movie released in 2010 and one that I'm actually quite a fan of, and that is The Last Exorcism. Now, I actually saw this film on the big screen upon release. I hadn't have, I hadn't seen a trailer. I hadn't read any reviews. I pretty much went into this film blind. Uh, just going by the title, I assumed it was about, you know, it was a horror movie about an exorcism. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised. You know, I went into this film, as I said, completely blind and walked out. And I actually thought to myself, that was a pretty solid horror movie. Um, this is a film that I really don't think gets much attention. Um, it really doesn't get talked about that much. Now, you know, demonic possession films are a dime a dozen. There are so many out there. The Exorcist, of course, being the granddaddy, you know, certainly one of the most iconic horror films of all time. Uh, we've had The Exorcism of Emily Rose, you know, among many, many others. And I actually think this is one of the better examples um, of, of the subgenre. Now, what I really like about this film as well, it actually adopts the found footage, the documentary style approach, and I actually think it uses it to really good effect. Um, I think the casting in this movie is great. I think Patrick Fabian, not an actor I'm familiar with, is just perfect as Cotton Marcus, uh, the lead character in the film. I think Ashley Bell is, is perfect in her role. Um, she's got that real sense of innocence and vulnerability about her. Um, but when she's actually possessed in that, shall we say, uh, she manages to be effectively creepy. Um, and also, again, not an actor I'm overly familiar with, but an actor called Caleb, Caleb Landry, um, who, again, in the screen time that he has, I think he does a great job. He was also in 2017's Get Out. And he kind of brings this kind of like a sense of intensity um, to the role. So this is a demonic possession film, if you will. There's certainly a psychological component to it as well, though. Um, and, you know, like I said, it adopts the first, it adopts the found footage approach. Um, now, this is the thing. This film was actually a big box office success. I think this film made over $67 million at the box office on a $1.8 million budget. This film made over, you know, made a lot of profit. Um, but again, I don't really hear it being talked about that much um, among horror fans. Now, from what you understand with this movie as well, is that um, there was actually a poster that was actually banned in the UK after receiving complaints now, I'm not actually sure as to what post this was exactly, but the image was deemed to be offensive and it caused quite some controversy. And uh, I don't really think this film, despite the marketing it had, even though it made a lot of money, I don't ever recall seeing much marketing around this film when it came out. Um, so, you know, just to get into the film itself, we basically follow... Um, you know, a priest, an exorcist, if you will. Um, you know, we're introduced to him. And I, I love the build-up to this film, actually. We get to find out where he's come from, etc. And this guy's a real character. This guy is basically a showman. You know, this guy's got a lot of charisma, you know, really playing up for the camera, etc. But we very quickly learn, actually, just less than ten minutes into the film, this guy doesn't actually believe in demons, he poses as a priest, and at one time, maybe he had belief, but there's actually a crisis of faith that he encounters when his son nearly dies, and his son feels ill, and he actually thanks the doctor. He should be thanking God, but he... he, he thank and that's when his crisis of faith really came into play. And over the years, he's just carried on with, you know, exorcisms and, and so forth, and preaching, but even though he doesn't actually believe in God... And demons anymore. Um, so basically, yeah, he, he's a charlatan, if you will. But the way he sees it is these people psychologically believe they're possessed. He's providing a service at the end of the day. Psychologically, they feel better afterwards. And he's got a wife and child to feed. You know, he's doing this, he's doing this for money. 
and we actually get to see you know how he actually pulls off this ruse you know rooms are rigged and he has over he has a recorder with over 800 demon sounds recorded on there um you know and uh it, it's really quite elaborate and even uses a battery to actually cause kind of vaults to cause convulsions you know to give the appearance of a demonic possession um, now he receives a letter, he goes out, I like the setting for this film, it's the middle of nowhere, it's kind of Louisiana I believe, it was actually filmed there, and I believe it was chosen to be filmed there, um, due to, uh, for whatever reason, it was actually a lot cheaper to film there, and uh, so yeah, set in Louisiana, and it's quite funny actually in Louisiana, because when they get there, um, it's kind of like the Bible Belt if you will, and all of these locals and that talking about all the stories that have gone on and that there used to be a cult living here. Um, there's a UFO landing site just down the road, um, you know, devil worshipping and all this and that. And it seems everyone's got a crazy story to tell. There's a lot of history to this place. Of course, he doesn't believe in all this stuff. So he's called out. Um, by a guy middle, living in the middle of nowhere that believes his daughter is actually demonically possessed. Uh, one of the tropes is cattle, his cattle being mutilated on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which is very synonymous with apparent demonic possessions. And he goes there, and he actually comes to realise, he didn't thoroughly read through the letter, but he comes to realise that it's actually a young girl. It's this guy's daughter that is supposedly demonically possessed. And typically he doesn't like to deal with children. I believe she's only 16 years old. And uh, so, yeah, he gets that. And he meets a young guy along the way. This is played by Caleb Landry. Now, interestingly, a lot of the characters in this film, a majority, um, their character names are actually the same as their actor names, their first names, um, which is kind of unusual. You don't actually see that too often. Um, but, yeah, Kay they're approached by a young man that basically tells them to turn around, drive away, and we soon come to learn that this young lad is actually the demonically possessed. Um, uh, her name is actually escaping me. Um, Nell, sorry. And uh, he actually comes to realise, actually, uh, quite early on, that this is a hoax. Now, this is one of them films that I feel like you might not actually notice everything upon first-time viewing. I think this film actually does a really good job with the characters that it presents to us. And it does, the ma it does manage to be effectively creepy in places. I think this film certainly has its creepy moments. But there is a level of... It is subdued. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there is one scene in particular in this film that really is quite brutal. You don't actually see it per se. But there's the murder of a cat. Which we actually see a painting. Which is presumably done by Elle. No, sorry. Of a dead cat cat white cat with blood all around it and then later on a cat is killed with what i believe the camera um now interestingly as well um in this movie the, the use of cg there was no cg actually used for the possession itself um the actress ashley bell actually has hypermobility which can basically loosen her joints you know uh way more flexible than ordinary which apparently I think less than 15% of the world's population actually have it. Um, so yeah, there's actually, you know, like in most demonic possession films, there's some body contorting and all that. Um, so yeah, now Caleb comes to realise he actually sees something. He sees Cotton actually placing something in the water in which he puts her feet. And Cotton actually says, you know, God, give us a sign if we should carry on with this with this procedure. And then the, the, the water starts bubbling. Apparently it's ordinary water. But we actually very quickly, it's kind of a blink and you'll miss it, if you will. He puts something in the water. Caleb notices this. And Caleb later actually approaches him and calls him a fraud. And he's kind of happy about it. And we actually come to realise, now I'm going to go into spoiler territory here. So for anyone that hasn't seen it, I don't want to ruin the movie for you, so I would say tune out, maybe return to this after you've seen the film. Um, Caleb is actually part of this. Now, the reason I believe... Now, Caleb approaches Cotton and actually says to him quite early on in the movie that he's worried, basically, for his sister because he's heard that people actually die during these um, exorcisms and, he, you know, he's really worried, etc. Um, but we actually come to realise that... 
he's not worried because of her potentially dying. Um, I believe it's because of what she's got inside of her. Now, there are some echoes of Rosemary's baby here, certainly. Certainly in the final act of the movie. Uh, we find out that she, uh, you know, she went to uh, a religious school, a Sunday school, run by Pastor Manley, and she was dropped out uh, for no good justifiable cause. And, you know, Pastor Manley actually plays a part in the bigger picture, in kind of a, a twist, if you will, near the end. Uh, that Pastor Manley is, in fact, part of this. Now, you know, there's a moment in the barn, I think one of the best scenes in the movie, actually, there's a scene in the barn where she becomes fully fledged possessed and, uh, you know, she's contorting her body and she says, you know, uh, Nell's here, she's in the fire, she's been in the fire for a long time, you know, if you keep quiet for 10 seconds, I'll let her go. And then she starts breaking it. You know, it's a scene that would probably make a lot of people cringe. She starts breaking her own fingers and that. And then she says, come here, you know, uh, I, I know, what is it, father? Um, father, come here, I'll give you a blowing job. And that's where he turns around and starts to think, hang on a sec, a blowing job, a demon. Now, this is where it actually implies and it kind of hints, is she truly possessed? Because a demon presumably would know that a blowjob is called a blowjob and it's not actually called a blowing job. And the movie certainly implies and points the finger that maybe she's actually being abused by her own father. She's chained up in the bed. We find out that she's actually pregnant. And of course, apparently she's a 16-year-old virgin. And this is where it starts, starts to lead you to believe that maybe she's being abused by, by her father. And of course, he believes, he says, should I say, that maybe it must be the demon. She's a virgin. The demon has defiled her. And there's apparently only one way of salvation. And that is to actually, um, they, they've got to die. That's the only way. Um, or an exorcism. So it gets to the point where he's actually willing to, to kill his daughter, you know, purely to, to save her soul. And there's a picture on in the there's another painting in the in, in the movie actually um, that actually shows the dismembered bodies, which again kind of hints towards the ending. Uh, we actually see presumably a priest, you know, someone holding a cross right in front of a big fire. This again points to the ending of the movie. Um, now again, like Rosemary's Baby, we don't actually see anything. We don't see a demon baby. At least I don't believe we do. Um, it's kind of left up to the imagination, but we hear these monstrous noises and that, and, you know, obviously a demon child, presumably, and it's in the final shot. They're running for their life and that, and Caleb kind of comes out of nowhere, and that's when we realise that Caleb was actually involved, who actually got attacked by Nell earlier on in the movie. Now, she blacked out. She doesn't recall the attack, which kind of tells me, I don't know if she genuinely did that, or if Caleb set it up. Um... But it's not until now. What I like about this in this film is we've got this main character. We've got this guy who's basically given up on faith and religion. He's doing this for money and he's now out of his element. It's a real demonic possession. They start to realise there's no real justifiable explanation for this. And he goes back. He tries in a way to redeem himself. He goes back. And instead of hiding and instead of running away, which they probably could have done, um, is that he actually goes out there and he tries to save the day. He tries to find one last ounce of faith. And that picture that we see is him essentially combating that final, um, that final sequence. And, um, you know, and I, I just think the film does a really good job with, you know, it's kind of a short and sweet horror movie. I think it's like 85, 86 minutes long. And, uh, you know, like I said, it certainly has its moments. There's some kind of jump scares and that kind of here and there. It's kind of a, you know, I, I, I find films like this kind of at the creepiness when it's kind of subdued and that. There's a moment where we hear, clearly hear kind of two voices from behind a door. And then he goes to open the door, but she's sitting there on her own. And he asks her, who were you talking to? And she says, no one. But there was clearly two voices there. And then there's a moment, quite a creepy shot actually, where she's up there on the wardrobe, creepily looking at him. 
and uh, you know they slowly pull her off the top of the water. I mean, how she got there in the first place is kind of a mystery in itself. And then, of course, it's kind of a jump scare. She runs off. And there's actually one shot, again, which is just, you know, blasphemous, uh, where she's actually stood outside the house and she's basically mimicking uh, Christ on the cross. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I think it's a really good um, exorcism movie. I, I, I think it does a really good job. And I think, like I said, I think it... It really does make good use of the format that it's actually using in this movie. Um, you know, the guy, the character Cotton, I think does a really good job of kind of, in a way, carrying this film. Um, not solely. I think the, all of the casting is actually very good um, in this movie. Um, but him him being the titular character, um, you know, like I said, we, we find out early on now, you know, there was a demonic possession that really started to change his mind about the whole world of it. Um, in which a 10-year-old boy who had autism, I believe, was actually killed during an exorcism, and it gave him nightmares. Um, he, he kept having nightmares of him killing his own son, and that's what really started to veer him away from uh, from belief and that, if you will. Um, you know, and uh, also, you know, I've got to say with this film as well... Um, that it, it does have that kind of psychological component that, that I really kind of like, that it does kind of imply at certain points that is this actually a demonic possession or is there something, some underlying trauma? And obviously it does point in the direction, like I said, that maybe she's being abused. And we do find out that she apparently had sex with a young guy. Now, which she kept secret from her father. Now, we actually find, see this young guy right near the end of the movie. And we actually find out he's gay and that she's basically lied about this. Now, I'm going to assume that the story has been implanted in her by the pastor. By Pastor uh, Manley. That he's actually implanted this kind of story within her. And obviously, you know, at this Sunday school, there's, there's sinister things uh going on and that she's been acted as, as a vessel to, to bring a demon into the world. Um, Abalam, I think is the name of the demon that defiles on the flesh. There's actually a scene that again is kind of creepy. This when you this is the first moment in the movie where you really start to think that something's really wrong. And that's where um, you know they've travelled away from the farm. They're basically five or so miles away late at night and she's in their hotel room. She's in Cotton's hotel room, so it's like, how did she travel that far? And how the hell did she know uh, that where he was staying? And they're trying to sort her out, and she starts, like, caressing him. And it's kind of creepy. It kind of uses this very kind of understated, kind of creepy score to kind of accompany the scene. Um, I do believe also that Ashley Bell actually spent over a month researching her role, including the study of several manias that she really went into research uh, for, for this performance and I believe there was a crew member uh, his brother was a real exorcist and he was actually on set um, he was advising the director and he actually makes an uncredited cameo in the film um, I believe it's uh, near the beginning of the film in fact um, so yeah I think uh, you know with the last exorcism um, as well I just think it's one of them horror films that uh, I think it's a good demonic possession film I think it's one that stands out from the crowd because of the format that it uses uh, with its characters. Um, even with its execution, I think its execution is is really good. And, um, you know, there was a film called, I believe it was called The Devil Within or The Devil Inside, which was also a found footage demonic possession film. Uh, nowhere near as good. Uh, I think that film ultimately, when that film actually started getting okay, should I say, the movie ends. Um, that movie has what is quite possibly one of the worst, if not the worst ending I've ever seen to a horror movie. Uh, completely terrible. Um, but yeah. And I know, you know, despite contrary belief as well, there was a lot of kind of uh, talks around as well saying that in this movie that uh, there were actually um, just locals and stuff. Everyone in this film was actually an actor. 
Um, everyone in this film was actually an actor. I've actually heard rumours, read rumours online, should I say, that real locals and that were actually used. Um, but they were all actors. And, um, yeah, I actually watched this on Blu-ray, and it does actually have an intro courtesy of Eli Roth, um, who was, I believe, attached to the film. I'm not really a big fan of Eli Roth, if I'm honest. Um, I don't really seem to, I, I don't really think he's the horror god like some people do think he is. Uh, but there's an intro from him and that, which is like 20 seconds long. <laughs> it literally adds nothing to the movie whatsoever. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's Last Exorcisms. One of my, probably one of my favourite found footage horror films. Um, possibly in my top 10. And one of my favourite demonic possession movies. Um, like I said, it's kind of short and sweet. I don't think this film really has any what I'd call padding. I don't really feel like there's any kind of unnecessary exposition. Um, I think the kind of build-up that we get um, with Cotton is, is really kind of interesting. You know, getting to see... He's a believable character to me. I really felt like he was a believable character. And, you know, he said that he's essentially doing this. If he could you know, save one child from being killed during an exorcism or whatever, um, that's doing God's work, you know, and obviously he's getting money for it too. So, um, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I want to talk about, actually, uh, regarding The Last Exorcism. Uh, I think it's a good horror film. Uh, for anyone that's not seen it, I would recommend it. And uh, yeah, I know its critic reviews are actually very good. It actually was met with a lot of good reviews. Um, but at the same time, I just don't really see it being talked about much in horror groups or among horror fans. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's it for today. Thanks a lot to everyone that listened, and I'll be back again soon to haunt you and torment you. Take care.